What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Go ahead, we'll wait for you. You hit that like button? Okay, cool. And make sure you leave a comment, man. I try to respond to all the comments. Any questions you guys got, hit me up, ask me. I'm going to respond to them. And I know, you know, a lot of people have sent me emails about the book being on the Walmart website or whatever. That's cool. Um, I had looked into that. That's all coming from Amazon. They got a little contract with Walmart or whatever. And I had a contract with Amazon, I guess, because that's where I bought all my books from. But it's all good. But I'd rather you buy it from us because obviously, you know, we make a little more money. We can do more things with it, right? So if you haven't already, that's the book. Blood on the Razor Wire. Go ahead and grab your copy, autographed copy. Um, FreedomFightersPC at gmail.com. Hit us up. We will definitely respond. Autographed copies are $25. That includes postage and handling. But today we're going to talk about USP Big Sandy. From the thumbnail, you can see what time it is. We're going to talk about my little fight with the California, the self-proclaimed California white shot caller. The guy that went to the prison and thought just because he was from California that he was this dude. Like he was that dude. Like he was going to do what he wanted to do. Um, it didn't work out that way. At least not as far as we went. Not the East Coast dudes. Um, so let's talk about it. USP Lee. I end up leaving Big Sandy, and for those of you that have read the book or heard my other stories, you know, when I went to USP Big Sandy, I walk into this cell, man, it smells like piss. They give us a bag lunch. You know, you've been eating bologna and cheese sandwiches for days, and you're just kind of like, what the? Man, if you like bologna, you won't like it after a month or two in federal prison. I can promise you that. Sometimes you get these big, thick-ass pieces, and you're like, it's all wet. They call it sweat meat, right? And if you haven't had sweat meat, then... uh I'm just going to tell you, you're not, you're not missing anything. And the cheese. You ever had cheese that you can put in a microwave that turns brown and it just bubbles up and never melts? That's the cheese. Absolutely disgusting. And you know, when you go to Big Sandy, you meet with the S any federal prison that you go to, you got to, in the intake process, you got to meet with the cops, right? SIS talks to you, the captain, they ask you a bunch of questions. And I talk about in that, in the book where the staff are like, yo man, the only advice I can give you is get a knife. And uh, don't get any tattoos on your face. Like, what? <laughs> like, I never really seen people with tattoos on their face until I went to federal prison. And when you get there, you're just looking at these dudes like, holy shit. I mean, this is 20 years ago when I first walked in. Been home what? Man, I've been home 20 months? No, 22 months. Thank God, man. Been free 22 months after almost 18 years in federal prison. So anyway, you know... After everything I had went through in Big Sandy, man, us beefing with the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, my celly getting stabbed, you know, it's time to get transferred now. And they come get me. I'm on a van and I'm like, damn, at first I don't know where I'm going, right? And I'm like, I'm going to go through the same ass process, man. Same ass thing that I went through. Got to meet with the people. They tell you all kinds of crazy shit. And then they assign you to a unit. And anybody that tells you when you walk into prison that they weren't scared or they weren't nervous, I'm here to tell you they're full of shizit. Definitely full of shit, man. Because when you walk into a prison, man, you're kind of like, this is the unknown. And you're coming from Big Sandy. You're going to, now I know I'm going to USP Lee. I finally find out. So I get to USP Lee and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to go through the same process. I'm sitting in a cell and I'm like, damn, man, because all the stuff that happened with Aaron Pike, right? And, you know, there was a little kite where got intercepted where they where the ABTs actually put a hit out on me. Um, They put me in what's called the hat. That just means that, yo, it's circulating wherever you go, man. We got a message out to our brothers. We're going to try to crush you wherever you wherever you end up, man. They're going to stab you, hit you up. Whatever they're going to do, they're going to do. But <clears throat> you got to be ready for business. So I already know, like, I got issues, right? So as soon as I get the USP Lee, I'm thinking, man, it's the, I'm getting busy right off the bus. Wherever I end up, I'm getting busy. Didn't work out that way. You get the USP Lee, it's different than Big Sandy. You get interviewed in Big Sandy and all that, and they're like, okay, grab your mattress, man. You're heading to the unit around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Not in USP Lee. They had a warden over there named O'Brien. O'Brien ran a tight ship, man. And I can honestly say this as a prisoner, and I think most of the cops would say this about this cat. Stu was the best warden in the BOP, man. Like, he's seen it both ways. You know, if you had something coming, you got it. Was he, was he kind at times? For a warden, he was, man. This dude would walk around on the yard. And all by himself with no cops escorting. He just come out there like he was a gangster, man. Um, Irish guy, probably tipped a few back. I remember there were times when I was on the yard selling sodas. He's like, give me a soda. I'm like, he's like, man, I said, give me a soda. You selling sodas on my yard? That's the tab you're paying. I'm getting a free one. And he'd drink a Pepsi right on the yard, man. 
pop that joker open, drink it, go talk to the dudes playing poker. He's letting the poker tables go. And the only time he'd like want to shut stuff down is when they came to do an inspection. They'd be like, yo, man, shut this shit down for three or four days. I'm telling out all the shot callers, kill that shit. This dude understood prison, man. He knew how to run a prison. He knew that people had to make money. He knew that people had to survive. And he knew how the shit worked. And that's why he ran a really good prison. He ran a tight prison. And I respected that dude, man. Probably the only warden. Rios was all right, but kind of did some bullshit sometimes. But, you know, Warden O'Brien was one of the only dudes that I really respected, along with his captain, Captain Wilson. You know, they were two good dudes, man, honestly. They were good dudes that ran, ran a ship that everybody could sail on, so to speak. Was there crazy violence there? There was. But it was definitely a prison where you could do your time, but you could definitely get killed there, too. So that's U.S. Pete Lee. So you get the U.S. Pete Lee, man. They talk to you. Hey, man, what's good? You all right? You got any problems? You in a gang? You a child molester? You tell on people. They ask you all these, these questions, right? They don't tell me to get a knife. They don't say shit. They put me in a cell, and I'm in there for like two hours, and I start hitting the glass. Boom, boom, boom. I'm like, yo, what's up, man? They're like, what do you mean, what's up? I'm like, I'm, I want to get the fuck out of here. What's up? They're like, man, you don't leave. You don't go to the compound at this jail until after the count when everybody's locked in. I'm like, damn, man, you don't go. So everybody's locked in. And I'm like, well, I'm not looking at my watch because it's in my property bag. But I'm looking at the clock like, holy shit, I'm going to be sitting in this cell for four or five hours. And for those of you that have never sat in a cell alone, I'm keeping it real with you, man. After a little bit, it starts playing, you know, mind games. You're like, man, what the fuck? They start getting stressed out. You start walking. You start rocking. You start thinking about your family. You start thinking about what's going to happen when you get out here on the compound. You start thinking like, man, am I going to attack one of these dudes? Are these dudes here? The dudes I'm beefing with? You just start thinking all kinds of crazy shit. You start thinking like, damn, I don't have to get a knife right away. I mean, I've already been in Big Sandy for quite some time now, right? And now I'm going. And now I'm at USP Lee. So I know how the federal prison system works. I know it's a dangerous place. I know walking into the unknown is definitely it's definitely scary, especially when you think you got some real serious issues. So anyway, long story short, man, they come get me at probably 10, 10, 30. It's dark out. The CO, I'll never forget this dude because he pointed a gun at me once upon a time. He's a real asshole. And if he's watching, I just want to tell him, man, you know, I know we shouldn't talk bad. And, but you know what? His name was Gerald. Gerald, if you're watching this, man, fuck you. How's that sound? Chad, why'd you say that? Well, because the dude was like one of the worst dudes ever. And because he pointed that gun at me, man. And I never forgot it and it always pissed me off. So anyway, he comes and gets me and he's walking me across the compound. He, you know, same questions that the SIS that guy asked. You. He's like, you'll be all right here. It's laid back here. But what car do you run with? You run with the white. Whites are serious here. He starts telling me all this, like, you know, how serious the white dudes are here and how racist it is and everything's separated. Okay, whatever. So then they take me in there. They take me to a cell. 10 o'clock at night. The dude's a bug out. I go in a cell with a bug out. He's, they knock on the window. Hey, man, got a celly. He opens the door, lets me in. I think the dude was from Colorado. Had white hair. He ended up trying to hang himself because they were going to transfer him from USP Lee, and he didn't want to get transferred. So I end up going in the cell with that dude. He gives me the rundown who's there, you know, what the prison's like and all of this. Come out the next morning. As soon as I come out, Usually the white dudes will approach you immediately. Oh, new white dude, let's talk to him. At least that's how it was in Big Sandy and all the other prisons. But on this particular morning, the first people that approached me are the Nortenos. Hey, man, where'd you come from? And one of the kids' name was Flacco, tall, skinny, white dude. His name, real name was Brad. I forgot his last name, man. I think he was white and Mexican from Northern California. And he had some issues in Coleman. And he ended up over at USP Lee. And let me tell you something. Them Northerners over there, the Nortenos over there, they got busy. Some of you heard the story about them. So they approached me right away like, man, what car are you, you in? Who you who you run with? Where are you from? Oh, you're from New York. And then the kid's like, oh, I mess with this dude right here, Piper. He's from Syracuse, black kid. And I'm like, oh, all right, man, cool. He's like, but who do you run with? I'm like, man, I told you like three times, bro. I run with the white dudes, man. That's what it is, man. And uh, they're like, all right. Because, you know, they had that problem, man, with the Aryan Brotherhood and Big Sandy. So as soon as I said I was from Big Sandy, their light bulbs went on. Because them dudes... They're kind of really militant, man. Like, they get busy, right? Don't make no mistake. There wasn't a whole lot of them, but they will definitely put in that work. They will definitely stab you. Definitely do whatever they do. Investigations. Like, these dudes are, like, super, I guess you could say, like, really intelligent dudes, man. Like, they're very militant, very intelligent, very methodical in the things that they do. So, they figure out, man, I'm not one of their enemies. So, thank God, right? 
Because at USP Lee, one of the only USPs I've ever been to, dudes were sleeping in on day one. Some of them white dudes were sleeping in. Eventually, this dude comes out. He's an armed gang member, Kevin. Um, there's another dude, Kirby. We'll do a little story about Kirby, too. Um, they approach me. This kid, Chris Orr, approaches me. He's from Jersey. I'm talking to these dudes, and this kid, Anthony Sabetta from Old Island. God bless Anthony. I heard Anthony passed away, man, overdosed or something. Um, but Anthony was definitely a wild dude, man. Got out of prison early and ends up dead, man, getting high. Crazy, right? So anyway, them dudes approach me, man. I start getting in the mix. USP Lee, here we are. Nothing like Big Sandy. I get a message. Hey, man, come to the yard. Some dudes want to talk to you. So I'm like, oh, shit. I start asking about the ABTs and the gang members. You know, to Anthony. Anthony's like, look, bro, it ain't even like that here, man. Like, we got the numbers, man. We're independents. We got the numbers. You don't have to trip. Everything's all good over here. Fuck them dudes. Fuck them gang dudes. So I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. I go outside and I run into my boy Dog from Jersey, right? He's like, damn, what's up, man? You know, Big Sandy, bro. It's, this is so much different. This is better. I run into the kid Spivey. You guys heard his story. He was the white crip that got stabbed. And they're kicking it. They're telling me, giving me the rundown of how the prison is, right? So I start getting in the groove of things here. And there's this dude that shows up, man. His name's Sparky. Comes from California. We're going to put pictures up there in the video so you guys know who he is, what he looks like. And you know, it's always good, man, when you put pictures with the people or you, you interview the people that you know, people that you did time with. Because people want to see it. They want to see who is this dude that you're talking about. They don't like the make-believe guys, like in the book. That's why I show people pictures of Adam and Aaron, you know, Pike, stuff like that. Wish I had a picture of Mr. Young because a lot of people want to see Mr. Young. A lot of people were like, yo, what's up with Mr. Young? What happened with him? So anyway, <clears throat> you know, I'm from the East Coast. And I'm going to tell you kind of how this shit goes, right? Like when, you, when you're from an area, you got a lot of time, you got money, you got leadership skills. People look up to you. I'm not going to say, man, I'm the shot caller, all right? We're not going to say that, but a bunch of my dudes looked up to me. And you've heard people, you know, that we've interviewed Dog. Bring Dog on for another interview soon. It was his birthday the other day. But um, people look up to you, man. When you got leadership skills, that's just how it goes. So I'm kind of like, you know, at the top for the East Coast dudes. We'll just say that. California dude shows up, Sparky. And you heard the interviews with Jimmy Mack. A lot of times, East Coast and West Coast dudes, we don't always get along, right? I mean, they just, they have different politics than us. Um, you know, and people have made comments, man, why you wear your hat to the side? Man, that's how we grew up. That's what we do. It's not a black thing, man. It's our thing. It's what we do, man. It's where we're from. Um, I've seen plenty of UFC fighters do that too. It's just what we do. It's just our style, our swag on the East Coast. And these California dudes don't really like white dudes from like New York and the East Coast. So dude don't like me. I don't like him for real. He lives downstairs from me, but I try to be courteous to this dude. And I think he tries to do, you know, he tries to do the same, right? Whenever there's an issue in the unit, he wants to try to come talk to me like, hey, man, listen, brother, you know, I want to talk to you about something, brother. And I'm just like, like, the dude was like a nuisance to me, man, kind of, you know? It's, to me, I was just like, some days I liked to do, some days I didn't like to do. And he lived below me with a Portuguese kid named Randy. He was also from California. And these dudes acted like they were going to come on and, you know, come on this compound at U.S. Pete Lee and implement like California politics with us. And we're like, yeah, right. And in my mind, I'm thinking, dude, you're existing because we want you to exist. Because for real, man, we kind of had the numbers, bro. And some people might watch this or that were there, um, maybe outlaw. And some people might think like, man, some of them East Coast dudes were lame. Some of them were. But I was able to motivate them to get busy if we had to. And I think dudes knew that, man. Um, some of the white dudes didn't like me. They thought I was arrogant. Um, you know, I have one dude, and I'm going to give you, you know, I'll give you this little backstory. I have one dude like, man, you think you're better than all of us. And I flipped out on a dude. I said, bro, I don't think I'm better than you. I know I'm better than you. That's I'm not calling my mother for money to get dope, to get high. I'm not in here doing some box and I'm not smoking chewing tobacco out of the CO's mouth. Oh, <sighs> one of the nastiest things you could ever see in federal prison, man. These dudes are smoking chewing tobacco out of the CO's mouth that he spits in a bottle. It's like black gold in there. So I told dude, I am better than you, man. And it got to the point where I was like ready to knock this kid's block off if I had to, right? I kind of wanted to refrain from it, but I would have if I had to, and I didn't. I just had to base up on him. Sometimes, man, it, you know, sometimes someone might try to pull your card in prison, right? But, you know, a lot of times you can pull theirs back. And I know people think, oh, man, prison's full of tough guys. There's a lot of tough guys in prison. But there's a lot of fake-ass tough guys, too. So anyway, me and the California shot caller, he lives downstairs from me, man, and, and you know, you want to talk about California politics and all of this shit. These dudes are up, man, like all night. 
And I'm used to being in prisons where, excuse me, I'm used to being in prisons where, man, when it's quiet time, when they lock the door, it's time to go to sleep. Even in USP Lee, even though some of them dudes would sleep in, man, I'm not sleeping in. Man, I get up. When them doors crack, I'm already up, man. I'm up at five o'clock in the morning brushing my teeth. And back then, we used to come out really early. They changed it a little bit now where you come out later where they open the doors at like 630 or whatever. At least that's how it was towards the end. But man, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning brushing my teeth. I'm up. I'm ready to go, man. It's showtime, right? Because like I said, you got to always be aware, man. You got to always be aware of what's going on. You got to always be ready. People are dying in these places. And I've seen people die in these places. So anyway, these dudes at night, man, I'm like, what are these dudes doing down there? They having pillow fights. They yelling. And sometimes, man, it got to the point where I'd have to kick the floor. Boom, boom, boom. Right. I'm banging on the floor. And, and then, like, oh, man, my bad. And then I yell in the vent like, yo, what's up, bro? People are trying to sleep. I'm trying to be respectful. Right. And I think these dudes are down there getting drunk. They're down there getting high, whatever they're doing. But they're always playing at night. Kick the floor. Boom, boom, boom. Then it's just getting to the point where you're like, yo, man. I'm about to do something to this dude, man. Tell my cellie, like, yo, I'm going to do something to this dude, man. This dude's being disrespectful. And when you're trying to sleep in prison, man, that's like your time away. Sleeping is the time when you're not in prison. So the next day, the next morning, I come out, and he's standing in the day room, right? And he's kind of suited and booted. I'm like, yo, what's up? He's like, what do you mean, what's up? And I'm like, yo, man, check this shit out, man. You know, every night, man, you guys are down there playing, yelling, screaming, like you're being disrespectful, man. And he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry, man. You know, uh, we don't mean to do that or whatever. And and he brushes this shit off. We brush this shit off. We kind of get, I think we have an understanding where he's going to, you know, relax at night. And it works out for about two or three weeks. And I'm a firm believer, man, in you can't fix something that you won't face. So sometimes you have to address shit, right? And it was kind of like we were going back and forth where we weren't, you know, I wasn't addressing it at first. I just let it boil, boil when I was holding back, when I should have just did it right from, right from the rip, right from the jump. So again, man, two, three weeks later, man, these cats are playing again. I'm kicking the floor. Maselli's kicking the floor. I got this big ass bag of legal work. I take it and I just, boom, I throw it on the floor, right? So it hits down downstairs. I'm sure a bunch of people woke up like, what the fuck? I take it again. Boom. And again, boom, I'm dropping this shit on the floor. And then I'm like, yo, man, what's up? Through the vent. So they keep going. Like they don't even, like now they're mad and I'm mad. Again, man, in the morning, I come down there. I tell my celly, man, I'm, I'm pressing this dude. And in my mind, I think dude ain't going to do shit because as I get to know him, I think, man, dude ain't really like that. But the one thing that I do know is that he had one of the baddest knives I ever seen. He worked in the kitchen. He was a butcher and they had a piece of stainless steel, man. I'm telling you, man, this looks like a real knife, like a like a chopper. And it, the, the steel was all bent over, kind of deranged like this. But man, it had it looked like a butcher knife, man. It wasn't really a real knife, but it was something that they made out of the stainless steel that he probably stole from the kitchen, right? And I'm thinking, damn, this dude's got a big ass knife, man. And I am a little bit worried. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little bit worried, but I think that I can base up on him. And you know, I'm an aggressive dude, man, or I used to be. And people say a lot of New Yorkers are aggressive. So I think in the morning, I'm going to come out and I'm going to bitch this dude. That, that's, that's what my plan is. I'm about to just press this motherfucker and it's going to be what it's going to be, but I don't think he's going to fight. So we're in the day room and I press him. I'm like, yo, what's up, man? You're being disrespectful. And he's like, man, I'm, man, you guys are being disrespectful, slamming shit on the floor. I'm like, look, man, stop pretending like you like me, bro. I don't like you and you don't like me. Boom, boom. And he tagged me. The kid tagged me, hit me. Pop, pop. So I'm like, oh, shit. Boom, boom, boom. I tag him back. We're, we're, we're toe to toe. Boom. And dude's like, yo, stop. Chill, man. There's this dude there that's saying, his name's Tommy Jackson. He's from Texas. Tommy, if you're tuning in, man, or anybody hears this, if you know Tommy Jackson from Texas, he was sentenced to life, and I think he got clemency from Obama and got out after doing like 30 years. Tommy hit me up. So anyway, Tommy's like, yo, man, he's he's the older dude in the unit that we all respect, right? Everybody like respects Tommy Jackson. He's the old timer. He works at Unicor. Um, he was known for being a tough guy, you know, once upon a time, but he's an older man now, right? And people do respect him. He's like, yo, man, you guys got to chill, man. The cops, man, chill, chill. Like, I guess some people really didn't want to see me fighting with the California shot caller, you know, self-proclaimed. Some dudes will chime in and say, he wasn't our shot caller. The dude acted like he was the shot caller, man. Dudes respected him. He came there like he wanted to put, you know, the prison politics together, whatever. But anyway, they're like, yo, man, take it to the quiet room, man. Take it to the quiet room. And I'm like, okay, fuck it. We're going to the quiet room. But I'm thinking in my head, holy shit, I don't want this dude to get back to his cell. So I tell Tommy Jackson, like, yo, man, don't let him get that knife, man. Don't let him get the knife. He's like, no, nah, man, you guys are going to do this shit head up. 
and I'm trying to avoid this cat making it back to his cell. He doesn't go to his cell. He walks up the stairs. We're heading to the quiet room. And before we get in the quiet room, I think that he's nervous. I'm nervous too, because I don't really know if he has the knife on him. But if he has the knife on him, your boy might have took flight instead of fight, right? So I don't know if he's got the knife on him. And I think he's nervous. Like, he don't want to go in the quiet room with me. And he's a pretty big dude. You'll see the pictures on the thumbnail. He's a pretty big dude, right? So I'm like, damn, I don't want this cat to grab me. Because if he grabs me, I might be in trouble. I just want to, you know, I don't like to wrestle, man. I wrestled in high school. I was the captain of my wrestling team. But I feel like we're men. If we're going to fight, man, let's get it, man. Let's let's bang out, man. Win, lose, or draw, let's bang out. And, you know, they call it shooting a five or whatever, right? So I'm like, man, really in my mind, like at that time, I'm like, man, I'm going to shoot the five at this kid. I want to hit him before he can hit me. And that's something else, man, in, in prison fights. I'm all, I always try to be first, man. Because usually if you're first, you, you're going to win. And once I hit you, man, I'm, I'm staying on you, man. I, like, I'm not tagging you and, and, and then that's it. The only reason that we stopped in the middle of the day room is because Tommy Jackson got in, in, in between us. But I didn't want to stop then. So as soon as we get to the day room door, man, I, I, I just, I hit the kid. Bum, 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 bum. And we're fighting. Bum, 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 bum. Toe to toe. I'm getting the best of the cat, man. And I'm not being arrogant. I'm just telling you what, what happened. I'm getting the best of him. He ducks down. Now, look, this is right when UFC, man, was like, you know, UFC was the thing. Remember that Forrest Griffin fight with Stefan Bonner? That's when I was introduced to the UFC, man, that fight. So this kid puts his head down and he tries to, like, tackle me. So I put my arm underneath him. And, you know, I've been watching UFC. I try to choke him, give him a knee, and we fall. We're on the top tier. Like, we're this close to going to where the railing is. And and I'm choking this cat now. We bang out a little bit. He ducks. I start choking him. He's on top of me. And I'm thinking, damn, man. I'll try to flip this kid over. I want to flip him over. I want to get him off me. He's he's a big dude. And I get him and I'm like, and he rocks back. He comes back. I couldn't get him over the top of me. Now he's on top of me, man. And I'm like, damn, I wrap my legs around him. Been watching the UFC. I wrap my, I don't know shit about how to do any of this UFC shit at the time, for real. So I wrap my leg. I've been in prison, man. They ain't teaching that shit in there. I can't go out there and get me a UFC class, an MMA class. But I'm just doing what i seen on TV. I wrap my legs around him, and I keep squeezing. I'm choking him. And this is no joke, man. The kid taps me like we're in the UFC. Like all white dudes watch UFC in prison, 90% of us. I'm choking. He taps me. And I'm not, man, we ain't, we ain't tapping out, man. This ain't tap out. I got 40 years, bro. I got you in my arms. And I'm thinking in that moment, if I let this cat go, what's he going to do? He's going to start raining down punches. I'm not letting this big-ass dude go. He's, he's bigger than me, and he's on top. But I got him, and I'm choking him, and then he taps me again and again. And then his hand starts to slide down. I'm like, there's no tapping. His hand's sliding down my arm, and I'm like, this cat's out. By that time, the cops are running in there. And I remember this big-ass cop, man. Him and his brother worked there, right? Man, I wish I could remember this dude's name, man. Worked at USP Lee. He ended up becoming an SIS officer. Honestly, man, this dude was like a really good and people watch this, but man, how can you say the cops are good dudes? Like this dude was real respectful, man. He was a good dude, man. Like he let you get extra trays. He, he, you know, if you were in the hole and he was working there, he would pass books for you. He'd pass newspapers, which is a big thing in there. And he's like, let him go, Marks, let him go. And I'm like, fuck that. I ain't letting this big motherfucker. I'm squeezing him. And they start dragging me. They probably drug me about from here to the, you guys don't know where from here to the windows are. You can't see the windows. Mm -hmm. Should I show you? Nah. So. He ends up dragging me probably, man, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 feet with this dude in my arms. And I let him go. I finally let him go. And I kick him off me like, and I get him off. He rolls over and the dude is asleep. He's snoring like, I'm like, oh shit. I'm thinking, man, is this dude going to die? Did I kill this dude? I'm like, that's the first thing that goes through my mind because I'm choking the shit out of him, right? And now he's snoring. You ever put someone to sleep? And I'm thinking, damn, I hope I didn't like crush this dude's windpipe. Start thinking all kinds of crazy shit. Long story short. Sparky ends up all right. We go to the hole. We get to the hole. I end up seeing him at rec like two or three days later. And back then, they had this thing that they called, we're going to marry you up. And I'm not going to lie to you, man. USP Lee was a good prison. If you're if you're in a maximum security prison, like I said, USP Lee was a good place, man. It's not a place I wanted to get transferred from. I had a store over there. I'm making good money. Um, I, I don't want to leave, man. I want to stay at USP Lee. So we, we're in the hole. I talked to him through the gate. He's like, hey, man. He said, you got some hands on you. He gave me my props. He said, damn, bro. You know, I thought you could fight a little bit, but you definitely got some hands on you, man. I'm like, all right, man. I appreciate it. And I'm just kind of like, this is weird. Like, the dude's congratulating me on, be on, on winning, right? So I'm like, yeah, you too, man. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, you got some hands on you. I mean, he did ding me a couple times. I'm not going to lie. Um, 
But I, in my mind, I wasn't really worried about any type of physical altercation with this cat. What I was worried about was the knife. I thought, man, I probably whooped this dude for real. And at first I thought I was just going to scare him and, 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 and he was going to do what I said. But men respect men. He didn't bow down and I give him his respect, man, for fighting and for hitting me first, right? Because I didn't expect that. So we end up in the hole and it's like, yo, you got to marry up with this dude. And I'm like, marry up with them. They're like, yeah, you got to go in a cage. So we know you two aren't going to fight each other. And then we'll let you both out to the compound. We get rode up. I probably got the shot in here somewhere. I don't know where the hell it's at. But um, they want to marry us up. So I'm like, all right, I'll marry up with the dude. But I'm going in the cage first. Because I'm not walking in there with a the little slider open and hand half cuffs on. I already dinged this kid up. I don't want him to start hitting me while I got cuffs on. So they're like, all right, you go in the self, you go in the cage first. So we, I go in the cage first. He comes in, we shake hands, but I'm kind of like, I'm thinking this dude, he's from Cali. And I'm thinking like, this dude might try to, you know, do something, but he don't. And eventually we make it back to the compound, man. We go to USP Lee and uh, they send us back to the same unit. And from that point on, man, guess what? My cell, he held the cell down. From that point on, man, everything was respectful, man. Like they stopped screaming and yelling at night. People are like, yo, what's up, man? But deep in their heart, I'm not going to lie to you. Deep in his heart and his Sally's heart, they didn't like me. Because eventually something ended up happening with me and they knew what was going to happen. Where this kid tried to, he tried to hit me with a bag of rocks. So it was their way of getting rid of me. Like the white dudes, whenever you're in prison, man, it's crazy how your own people, it's always your own people that end up, you know, having animosity towards you. Or they're like, oh, man, dude, think, man, he's from New York, man. He's not, you know. He thinks he's got money because I was a hustler, man. I had a store in there. Um, I ended up selling snow cones. You know, that's another story where the snow cone, man, we go to, and I think Jason Durgan talked about it, Green Eyes. You know, we got a softball game. I go over and tell the snow cone, man, like, hey, man, what's up? Let me get a couple snow cones real quick. And you know, the snow cone, man, only been there like a couple months, man, like two months. I didn't really know him. But usually, you know, I guess this is kind of some bullshit, but. Usually, dude, like, people, you know, the white dudes looked out. You know, even if they disliked me, they knew I had money. They knew I had a little pull. So I'm like, hey, man, I need a couple snow cones real quick. We got a softball game. He's like, hold on, man. And I'm like, what? This dude's like a suboxone addict, right? I'm like, what? I'm like, hey, bro, I said, man, give me two snow cones. And he jumped up. He's like, man, I told you. And he pointed at my face. And what do you think happened? Pop, pop. I bing his ass. And he starts bleeding. And he gets right down on the floor and starts making these snow cones for us. I'm like. This is like some of the weirdest shit ever, right? Like, I just binged the dude, and, and now you're just going to make us a couple snow cones? And he did. We, I guess we took the snow cones, went over to the softball game, and dude ended up checking in. We'll talk more about the snow cone, man, in another video, in an interview. Maybe I'll find green eyes and let him tell the story, right? So I'm not telling my own story. Um, or even, I think Dog. Dog was there when that shit happened, too. And we'll talk about it. But anyway, man, that's USP Lee, man. That's what USP Lee was like. That's what it's like, you know. To get into it with your own people, man. They're, you know, they don't like you sometimes. And they'll talk about you. Don't think because you're in federal prison in a maximum security prison that people don't gossip. Because people do gossip in there. Even the tough guys gossip, right? I mean, some dudes don't. People like Tommy Jackson, I don't think he would gossip about people. But some people do, man. Have I have I been guilty of gossiping? I have once in a while, but I, I catch myself. Because, you know, when you talk about someone in prison, like let's say I'm talking to you. Or I'm talking to this dude named Jimmy. I'm talking to Jimmy. I'm like, yeah, Jimmy, man, dude's a bitch. He's a piece of shit. You know, that might go back to the other dude. And then you don't even know that dude knows. You could be at the computer. And dude will come up and hit you in the net. Because you're gossiping. Because you're talking about people. So, federal prison, man. I try not to gossip. But I ha I I've been guilty of it. Other people are, man. Definitely, man. I want you to think about that knife that I talked about, right? Federal prison. There's a knife. There's all kinds of knives, but like I said, this is one of the baddest knives I've ever seen in prison. Um, I think that deer antler was probably the baddest, and that this was the second baddest. But it's a place where you could definitely leave your blood on the razor wire. And what I mean by that is it's a place that you could die. You could live or die. Federal prison is a place where you will live or die. And sometimes you might end up dead, not because of your own actions, but because of the actions of other people. You might end up dead because someone don't like you. You might end up dead because someone decides, man, today's the day that I don't feel like being here anymore. You know, um, some guy might be like, you know what? I'm just going to stab this dude, get a good detention order and go. Come on, Chad. They don't do that. They gonna, someone ain't going to just stab you for no reason. Trust me. I've seen it. There's some nutcases in there, man. I've been stabbed over $45, man. Dude owed me $45 and stabbed me. I've seen another dude stab a dude because he said he wanted to go to the ADX and get his own TV. 
A kid that was going home, stabbed him in the neck, blood everywhere. That was in USP Tucson, man. And I'm just like, wow, this is, this is it, man. This is the life that we're living. It's a crazy life. It's a dangerous life. It's not the life that you want to live. It's not the place that you want to be. You don't want to be fighting the shot caller. What happens if you get into it with the shot caller and he's got five homeboys in there or you guys are out on the yard and you ain't got no homeboys. You got no one to help you. And trust me, these dudes will brutally kick your head in, especially the white dudes, man. White dudes in federal prison are dangerous, man. It's balls to the wall. They will beat you until the cops come and tackle them. They will kick you in the head with them boots. They will stab you. They will hit you with a lock. They will plot on you. And I'm not saying all white dudes are bad because that's not what it's about. It's about, hey, man, the white dudes will get busy. Black dudes get busy. Hispanic, Mexicans and Native Americans at the top, man. So that's our little take on USP Lee, man. Hope you like it. And more than anything, I hope you stay out of prison, not the place you want to be. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out with respect. Thank you.